Lil and I were married in May of 1972. We left immediately from the reception, headed north. We were married at the chapel at the South Texas Children's Home, headed toward Amarillo. I was scheduled to spend the summer there, had one more year of seminary, and I was in a chaplaincy training program for that summer. It's called clinical pastoral education. About midway through the summer, floor that I was assigned to, I knocked on a door and was invited in. There were three men standing around this woman's bed, her husband, her pastor, and one of the elders from their church. On the movable tray table that slides across the bed was one of those little plastic cups that pills are dispensed in. It had oil in it. They invited me to join them as they anointed her with oil and prayed for her healing. Finished the summer, went back to Fort Worth to seminary, graduated the next May, went back to Amarillo for nine more months, three more quarters of clinical pastoral education, chaplaincy training. Probably about January or February, a call came to the pastoral care department for a chaplain to come to ICU. As I walked down the hallway and approached those double doors, they opened and a man st stepped out and I recognized him as the husband who was standing beside that bed 18 months earlier. Weeping, broken, his wife had just died. They had been to Houston to MD Anderson. They had tried everything that they could, but nothing worked. The greatest grief I encountered that day in him was his guilt. He said, I didn't have enough faith. If I had just had more faith. When they stood beside her bed and prayed, their prayer was based on James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. I didn't have enough faith, he said. How do we reconcile James 5, 15? The prayer offered in faith will save the sick. With those times when someone prays in faith and their loved one dies. How do we reconcile that? Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty four, whatever you ask believing, you shall receive. And in Matthew 17, 20 and 21, Jesus said that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can say to a mountain, be moved into the middle of the sea, and it'll be done. The burden seems to be on us in the measure of our faith. And yet, just a mere 25 to 30 years later, the Apostle Paul, obviously a man of deep faith, reported in 2 Corinthians 12 that he prayed three times for the Lord to heal him of some malady he called a thorn in the flesh. And three times the Lord said no to his prayer. I'm so grateful for those words he recorded in verse 19, words that the Lord spoke to him. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And Paul's conclusion was not guilt over failed faith, Rather, he wrote in verse 20, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, 
with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So how do we pray for a miracle? It's really very simple. We do what God's word said. We pray in faith, believing that God will grant our request while resting in the fact that he is a good God who will do what is right and what ultimately is best for us. John addressed this dilemma in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. One of my seminary professors addressed the assertion of some that if we have enough faith, God is bound to do what we ask for. He referred to it as presumption masquerading as super faith. Prayer is a privilege which we express our faith through and it is our walk in fellowship with God but nothing we do, nothing we can say obligates God to do anything that we ask. Ultimately we pray Jesus' garden prayer Luke twenty two forty two, 42. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. This came home very personally for me during the time of Lil's pregnancy with Rachel, our third child. I've shared the story with you before. At five months, the doctor said, this baby's not growing. And he had a diagnosis, he called it placenta insufficiency. And if you remember my sharing this testimony story with you, it reversed at about seven, seven and a half months and she came to term, was delivered by C-section, was healthy and strong. And the doctor brought this little tray to me and said, I want you to see this. Wasn't sure I wanted to see it, but he stuck it under my nose anyway. He said, this is the placenta. He said, you see all this shimmery silver part here? He said, that's what it's all supposed to look like. See this yellowy part here? That confirms my diagnosis. It was placenta insufficiency. And you only have one to thank for this baby. She's our little miracle. But during the weeks of uncertainty, the fifth month, the sixth month, the seventh month, we began to pray. And it's during those times of prayer that I became better acquainted with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Carl read this story earlier for us from Daniel chapter 3. We learned from Daniel 1 that Daniel and his three friends were part of that first deportation from Judah when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah. The first conquest was in 607 B.C. They were a subject nation, but they didn't cooperate very well, so finally Nebuchadnezzar came back and destroyed the city of Jerusalem, demolished the temple in 587 B.C. But Daniel and his friends were in the first deportation. They distinguished themselves in the training that they went through for royal service, and then Nebuchadnezzar had that dream. And Daniel interpreted his dream and was elevated to, quote, ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And in Daniel 2, 49, it says, and Daniel made request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon. And Daniel was at the king's court. And then Daniel 3 tells us about the golden image, 60 cubits high. That's about 100 feet. Hey, guys, how tall is this building? It was a tall statue, gold-plated. And everyone was summoned to the dedication. 
Music was played by all those instruments that Carl read for us earlier. And everyone was required to bow down and worship. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not. And some who must have been jealous of them brought word to the king. And verse 8 begins the focus for today. They did not bow down. They were brought before the king. And the king thought he was very magnanimous. He gave them a chance. Okay, we're going to play the music again. And this time you bow down. And that's when we read what they said in response to him. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, if what you say is true and you're going to throw us in the fire, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we, were, we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Three things this morning. A person of faith knows that God is able. All power belongs to him. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. One theologian wrote, God is that one greater than which there is no other. You talk like that all the time, don't you? God is that one greater than which there is no other. No one is bigger or more powerful than God. The big theological word is omnipotent, all-powerful. There is nothing that God cannot do. But we have to acknowledge, granted, he has set limits upon himself. He established the laws of nature and usually allows the world the world to function by those laws. However, he established them so he can supersede them when he chose or chooses. Take the weather, for example. Throughout the scripture, he has brought on droughts as an expression of judgment and sent abundant rain as an expression of blessing. God has the power to supersede the laws that he set in motion. And when God acts, Outside of the natural order, we call it supernatural. We call it a miracle. One of my seminary classes had an assignment that we were to uh, schedule a, an interview with some pastor. Somehow I came up with a pastor at one of the large churches in downtown Fort Worth huge church other than Baptist and I go in and meet this learned old man I mean he looked ancient to me gray hair very stately they ushered me into his huge spacious office and I sat down we introduced ourselves and he understood why I was there and the first thing he said to me was do those professors out there at that seminary still teach that the miracles are true? I'm in shock. How do you respond to that? I had just had my first in-person encounter with theological liberalism. He did not understand, learned as he may have been, that we stand under the judgment of God's word rather than God's word standing under the judgment of our reason. There's nothing that God cannot do. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that. Our God is able. Whatever I face, whatever you face, whatever crisis, whatever illness, God is able. All power is his. And then second, a person of faith knows that God will act in behalf of those who trust him. Verse 17b, and he will deliver us out of your hands, O king. In my story about Rachel and the pregnancies, I found myself praying through those weeks with a growing confidence that she was going to be all right. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to pray with confidence that he's going to answer our prayer. I think about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Our understanding is limited. We think we know so much. We think we're so smart. But God's word tells us that there are times when we need to put our understanding on hold and trust him and trust him. And we can trust him as we pray with confidence, even though it may defy reason. We trust him. The confidence of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is a model for us. Faith believes, is confident that God will act. And he always does. Maybe not in the way we're praying, maybe not in the way we expect, maybe not in the way we want, but he's always acting in our behalf. And that brings us to the paradox involved in this. You all know what a paradox is, don't you? Paradox is when two seemingly opposing thoughts can both be true at the same time, though they look mutually exclusive. God tells us to pray, believing, and yet at the same time understanding that he may say no. Well, does that create a doubt in our minds that negates our praying in belief? No. We can't do theology without paradox. For instance, God became a man. Jesus is both God and man. That's a paradox. How can those two things be true? And Jesus said, you'll find your life by losing your life. How can that be true? It's logically inconsistent. It defies our reason. It's a paradox. We can't do theology without paradox. And this is a paradox that we deal with here in this passage and in all of those passages that I read earlier. We're told to pray in faith, believing, trusting that God's going to act. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thousands of years ago, had an insight into theology that many of us miss. Verse 18, faith grows strong. When the answer is no. But even if he does not, they said to the king, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden calf, the golden image that you have set up. But if not, 
God knows what we don't. God sees things we can't see. The quality of their faith should inspire us. They stood in the face of death, a blazing fiery furnace, and said, our God is able, our God will deliver us out of your hand, but if not, does not alter or change our faith one bit. I'm reminded of Job's expression, quality of his faith in Job 13, 15, when he said of God, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. God can do anything, and he can do anything with us that he wants to do. He is sovereign. He is the creator. He's the one who's given us life. And our faith is in him, not in the outcome. Our faith is in him. God is able. God will act. But if not, I could go on with a long list of examples where deep prayers of faith were offered and God was either silent or said no. Two and a half years ago, my brother Healthy one day, sick the next, two weeks later, dead. And we prayed. God said no. As I was driving in this morning praying about this, a friend came to mind that I hadn't thought about in months. John Randall, one of the most effective evangelists I've ever known in the state of Texas. We had him preach revival three times in Bishop where I was pastor. The first time John did what he always did so well, we got an uh, opportunity for him to speak to students in the schools. He did a motivational speech, stay off drugs, stay in school, but at the end able to say, hey guys, we're going to be in this high school auditorium tonight, come back, we're having pizza, and then a band's going to play, and I'm going to speak again. Hundreds of kids showed up that night, 57 made a profession of faith in Christ that night. John Randalls was an effective pastor and then evangelist. He was not feeling well the last time he was with us for a revival. It was in the spring. Weeks later, I learned that he was diagnosed with cancer. A few months later, he was gone. And I was visiting with another pastor, a mutual friend who appreciated John as much as I did. And he said, I just don't understand why God would take someone so soon who was so effective in the kingdom work. We don't know. We don't understand. God doesn't always say yes. Often he says no. Miracles are miracles because they're rare. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego should inspire us. Our God is able. All power is his. And he will. He will deliver us. He's got us in his hand. But if he doesn't deliver us in exactly the way we want or are praying, even in faith, he's still God. And he's got us. We can do as the writer of Hebrews admonishes us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 